the Bible. You live by the word of God. The word of God has a way of giving you compass to navigate your way. If you want the knowledge of God in your life, if you want to increase and grow and multiply the knowledge of God's word in your life, spend time in his word. Hello there. Um, good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to the uh, members, members of International House of His Presence, and good evening to all family, friends, partners, um, viewers from various parts of the world um, who are joining with us, Church in the Clouds, again today. Today is our discovery service on the platform of International House of His Presence. It's always a privilege to be alive and um, every living should always take cognizance of that and also an added privilege to know the lord the bible makes me to understand that they that know their god shall be strong so strength in diverse forms comes through the knowledge of god and what a privilege not only to be alive but also to be alive in christ to walk consciously in the knowledge of the Lord. So I'd like to welcome every one of us once again to this special and service in the clouds. I'm sure we're taking advantage of this lockdown moment, using it to dig deeper into the knowledge of God, ask God questions. God wants in the sincerity of our heart that we're asking questions because he's eager to respond to us. In the process of asking God from a sincere mind, he is able to unveil himself and unveil his purpose to you. When Paul met Jesus on the way to Damascus, that great encounter reported in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, chapter 22, chapter 26, you will see that in that encounter with Jesus, Paul was just asking questions. Who are you, Lord? What will you have me to do? So I feel questioning should be a very vital part of anyone who wants to know the Lord and develop in the knowledge of, knowledge of the Lord and gain stature in the knowledge of the Lord. Jesus went into the temple asking the doctors of the law, asking them questions. So questions should be a part of our Christian work. Today, we continue our empowerment series. I like us, I like to challenge us. Let's join, let's invite, let's like, let's tell friends, tell family, let's um, have a, a party of this broadcast even on our social media platforms, inviting other people. Um, the, um, the handle is His Presence NG. You can get us on our um, on the YouTube channel. You can get us on Facebook. You can even get on our website, www.houseofhispresence.org. You'll be able to watch um, us in, on this platform. So today we'd like to continue on the series we've been looking into this month of May. We call this empowerment series. Um, we've been looking into God's plan, God's promise, God's purpose, God's precedence from scriptures concerning empowering people, prospering people materially and financially. And um, the last time we shared with us on principles, divine principles and strategies towards divine wealth. Today we'd like to take it a little bit further. We we'll call this one. This is the fifth part in this series. We we'll call this one trustees of true riches, and we are getting deeper into this river of divine plan and divine um, purpose for wealth. Trustees of true riches. I take my text mainly from Luke chapter sixteen, from verse one to verse thirteen. But for time, I will just pick a few verses from that passage. Trustees of true riches. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for an awesome time again to be alive, to be alive in Christ, to walk with you, to, to, to learn at your feet, to sit at your feet, to receive wisdom from you, to receive insight from you that can be deployed into the various fields of our lives that we may do exploits. We thank you for the people viewing us out there. We thank you for the awesome things you are doing for us, even in the midst of this global restriction of movement and activity. Lord, we trust you that you will unveil your agenda unveil your purpose, unveil your plan, unveil your power, and distinguish your people on the face of the earth. As many as come to you from various walks of life, various nations, various backgrounds, 
you said you will make a difference between those who serve you and those who don't. These are the days upon us, O oh God, to prove your word alive and real in our lives. And we thank you for answered prayers because we are prayed in Jesus' name. Just about a month ago, God put a very strong word in my heart, which I'd like to start with here today. He said there is coming a massive shift of wealth. There is a massive shift of wealth that is coming. Probably it's even already upon us. Wealth does not leave the earth. It only shifts location from nation to nation, from people to people, from family to family, from place to place. For example, the wealth of nations shifted to Egypt under the watch of Joseph. And wealth shifted from empire to empire, from the Babylonian Empire in the days of Nebuchadnezzar to the Medo-Persian Empire in the days of Cyrus um, to the Grecian Empire in the days of Alexander the Great to the Roman Empire in the days of the Caesars from Rome. So wealth is like a current, the current of a river. No wonder money is called currency in the various nations of the earth. Money is called currency it flows from place to place from hand to hand from location to location as people engage skills engage their abilities their talents their time their cerebral prowess wealth shift hands as people engage their skills in transactions trade policies trade deals uh, th th this massive shift of wealth will position many to become more relevant on earth, particularly towards God's agenda and purpose on the earth. And suddenly, some who are obscure will begin to gain stature and prominence as they pursue God's will, engage God's resources, and deploy God's resources towards the greater causes of God. I'd like to challenge you, dear friend. These are not cunningly devised fables. We don't say what the Lord has not sent us to say. We just stay with teaching. We don't have a prophetic word. But this is a word from heaven. A massive shift of wealth is upon us on the earth. You can position yourself as the currency of the river of wealth is flowing from place to place and shifting hands. You can do certain things to position yourself so that as the current flows along its pathway you are strategically positioned to be able to get your portion on it towards the greater causes of god god is in the business of raising people and making people families nations wealthy you read in psalm 119 and psalm 113 he said god is the one who takes the poor from the dung hills of life and sets them amongst the princes. God is in the business of making people, raising people, equipping people, families, nations, and distinct and fulfilling his promise and purpose in their lives. He has done it before. He has done it with Abraham, did it with Job, did it with Isaac, did it with Jacob, did it with Joseph, with David, with Solomon. He has done it before. He has done it with Asa, did it with Ezekiah, and he's willing to do it again. Having said that, remember the last time we shared with us vital, underlying, foundational principles towards divine wealth. And the process of that we shared with us emphatically. You can make, wealth, uh, make money through diverse means. You don't have to follow God to make money. You don't have to follow the ways of God to make money. You can steal into wealth. You can cheat into wealth. You can sell hard drugs, become a drug baron into wealth. You can use government position, a public position for personal aggrandizement. You can marry your way into wealth. You can work hard into wealth. But the wealth, the riches the Lord gives, when you engage God's principles, you engage divine strategies, it makes rich. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow. No sorrow in any form. You sleep, you sleep well. <laughs> you do what you have to do without looking over your shoulders. Having said that, as we position ourselves and look into this subject, trustees of true riches, the question is to be asked, what are true riches? Why don't you just talk about riches, wealth, and all that? Why do you qualify it as true riches? Because as the language of scripture, um, I'd like you to study Luke chapter 16 from verse 1 to verse 13. But particularly, let me read from verse 9 
to verse um, 13. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And I, Jesus speaking here, and I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you feel they may receive you into an everlasting home, who is faithful in what is least, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, wealth generated in an environment of unrighteousness, and you have not demonstrated faithfulness and righteousness in that environment, he said, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or the diabolic influence over riches. So what are true riches? Let me quickly qualify that. Number one, true riches can be called wealth that is enduring. Wealth that can outlast challenges, economic storms, oppositions, afflictions. A classic example being Job. Job went through trials. He was afflicted. He lost the business for one moment, but eventually he bounced back and bounced back greater and greater. True riches is wealth that is enduring. This is wealth that is sustainable and can be bequeathed from generation to generation. You read in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22, it says that a good man, a good man, leaves an inheritance, a legacy, a heritage of wealth, if I may say, to his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner, who is not a good man, the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So what are true riches? Wealth that is enduring, can outlast storms, outlast crises, outlast challenges, outlast afflictions. Furthermore, what are true riches? True riches can be regarded as wealth that is not tainted by fraud or wickedness. Wealth that is not tainted, not corrupted, not stained by fraud. A public officer who uses a public office to amass public wealth to himself or herself at the expense of using the, the public funds to attend to the needs of the public. A public officer who uses public position, public power to amass public funds to his private, um, to become his private wealth at the expense of the needs of the public is a wicked person. It's wealth attained by fraud and wickedness. And that's, those are not the people who qualify to be trustees of God's kingdom. These people disqualify from theirs, themselves from the massive shift of wealth that is coming. In fact, these people position themselves for the wealth in their custody to shift out of their hands into the hands of those who would be found in righteousness. So wealth that can be regarded as true riches is wealth that is not tainted by fraud or wickedness. Look at a good example from the life of Abraham. These were things Abraham did. Abraham had to be schooled. Genesis chapter 14. Abraham had to be schooled in the ethics of gaining wealth by righteousness. Wealth the right way. He was schooled by a king who also was a priest, Melchizedek. And so amongst other things, you see that report in Genesis chapter 14 from verse 18 to verse 23. But I'd like to read because of time just from verse 22 to verse 23. You can read the whole hog from verse 18 to verse 23. Abraham's encounter with Melchizedek. It was an encounter for ethical adjustment and alignment so that God may fulfill the great promise for wealth that God had promised to Abraham. So he had to find, he had to be schooled in ethical correction and alignment to position himself as a trustee, a generational trustee of true riches. Look at this Genesis chapter 14 from verse 22 to verse 23. After he had met Melchizedek, he met two kings in that passage. He met a righteous king who was also a priest who schooled him in righteousness. Then he met the king of Sodom, a, a worldly leader. But 
it was in divine precedence that God had to make him to meet a, a king of divine order, Melchizedek, a type of Jesus, before he met a worldly king who offered him things, offered him wealth. And look at Abraham responding here. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, having met the king of Salem, the king of peace and righteousness, he said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hands to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of the heavens and the earth, that I will take nothing from a thread of a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, the way of the world, the king of the world. I will not take anything that is yours lest you should say <laughs> the world made Abraham rich. The system of the world made Abraham rich. I have made Abraham rich. So, true riches can be described as wealth that is not tainted, not spotted, not corrupted, not stained by fraud or wickedness. Furthermore, the third explanation of true riches here, true riches can also be regarded as wealth that is acquired by righteousness. Wealth that is acquired by righteousness. Such wealth that is acquired by divine principles like we shared with us a few days ago, such wealth that is acquired by divine principles and, um, excuse me, wealth acquired by divine principles of righteousness, of mercy, like we, show, we showed us, excuse me, from Psalm 86 and from Psalm 89. Wealth that is acquired by fairness, by equity, by righteousness, by mercy, by truth, and by peace, wealth that is acquired by righteousness. And a good example for that also I take from scriptures is David. David was also a man who came to great stature, came to great financial estate, which became generational. He was able to bequeath the same to his family, to Solomon, and to generations after him. But how did David position himself to become someone God could trust with the resources, with the treasures, with the wealth of God's kingdom? And look at an underlying principle of David's life here. David, when he was even yet to become a king and national treasury was, was at his disposal. 1 Samuel chapter 31. At this time, David was a mercenary soldier. Also because of time, because I'm trying to compress so many things into this time we have today. I'd like you to study the whole of 1 Samuel chapter 31. But I'm going to pick some verses here. I'm going to read just from verse 21 to verse 26. David was a mercenary soldier. He had about 600 faithful soldiers. He had trained and equipped and prepared for war, for battles. And they were fighting the battles of territories, of nations. They win on behalf of those kings and nations. And they were duly remunerated or rewarded. As mercenary soldiers but you see a time came while they went on a military campaign of enemy troops came the Amalekites came invaded David's camp took all their the, he, I mean his wives and the wives of all his troops took their animals took their children and cutted everything away and when they all came back they were all grieved David cried in fact the people his troops they thought of stoning David because they were distressed at the situation they found themselves in. But look at an underlying principle here that makes for true riches. First Samuel chapter 31, from verse 21 to verse 26. When they had come, David inquired of the Lord. That those are principles we look at some other day. And God told him, go against the troops. You will doubtless overtake them. You will doubtless overcome them. And you will doubtless recover all. And God proved his word. And they came back with not just the things that have been taken from them, they were also able to take from I mean, spoils of war from these Amalekites. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David. He had, remember I said he had 600 soldiers, but as they were going on that military campaign, 200 became tired along the way, so David had to leave them and proceed with 400. So when they were coming back with the spoils of war, now David came to the 200 who were so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to stay at the brook Besor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him, that is the 400 troops. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men, that is amongst the 400, who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's 
wife and children. Let me monetize what happened. Let's say, apart from wives and children, David also was able to, I mean, what was stolen from David and his troops was maybe equivalent to $1 million. And now, in coming back, they now had maybe equivalent of $3 million. So these the sons of Belial, wicked guys amongst David's troops of the 400 that went to the battle front, they felt, look, let's just give them what was stolen from them, their wives, their children, and maybe their livestock. We're not going to give them out of the extra from the remaining $2 million worth excess of the spoils of war. And look at David's response here. He said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord, remember also the counsel to Abraham, blessed be Abraham of God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. There is nothing we have that we have not received. God gives wisdom. God gives intelligence. God gives abilities. God gives skills. God gives money. These are intangible assets. We'll be looking into some other day. But look at this here. When David responded to those sons of Belial, he said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us. Who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us? For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is, who goes down to the battlefront? so shall his part be who stays by the supplies who are who those who are weary could not go all the way to the battlefront with us who stayed with the supplies they shall share alike so it was from that day forward he made it a statute that is a policy an executive order and an ordinance for israel to this day of this writing now when david came to ziglag he sent some of the spoil that is out of the $2 million worth of excess spoils of war. He sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And look at all the territories he sent of the spoils of war to, from verse 27 to verse 31. So David was an equitable leader. He was a fair leader. He will not abuse his leadership. He will not take on due advantage of people. He will not take from people and not give back to them. He will not take off their skills, take off their energy, take off their time, take off their loyalty and faithfulness and not give back to them. So if you are going to, be, I mean, what do we call true riches? It is wealth that is generated by righteousness by mercy, kingdom principles of mercy, righteousness, truth, equity, fairness, and justice. So these are three basic explanations of true riches. I take it further to the second level here today. Who is a trustee? Who can be regarded as trustworthy of heaven's resources? Heaven's wealth, what God is bringing upon the earth today, what God is causing to shift hands from the hand of the sinner to the hand of the righteous. Who is a trustee? I start with dictionary dictionary definition of a trustee, and our dictionary here says a, a trustee is a person, usually one of a body of persons, like a board of trustees, appointed to administer the affairs of a company. Or an institution or i would like to add an estate maybe like a family estate family wealth a tr board of trustees have been chosen that look until these children come of age you are trustees to help to hold this in trust on behalf of these children so a person usually one of a body a trustee is usually a person one of a body of persons appointed to administer the affairs of a company institution organization or i would like to add estate also, a trustee is a person who holds the title to property for the benefit of another. That is more in the context of an estate, someone's will, a wealthy man who left an inheritance for his children's children, but the children are yet to come of age to be able to handle those things judiciously. So, a trustee is selected to hold the title to the estate, to the property, for the benefit of those children. Having explained that from dictionary dimension, I'd like to take it further. In God's kingdom, who is a trustee? One, a trustee in God's kingdom is one that can be held in trust with kingdom resources, kingdom wealth, kingdom riches, kingdom treasures, 
kingdom power. One who can be held in trust with kingdom resources. Closely related to that, I also like to explain a kingdom, a, a trusting in God's kingdom, a trustee of God's kingdom is one who does not lay claim. I own this, I own that, I have this, I have that. One who does not lay claim or ownership to divine resources in his or her care. The resources may be, I mean, laying claim to those things may be in thought that eventually affects conduct and eventually affects lifestyle. A trust in God's kingdom is one who does not lay claim. Anything God brings to him or her, he attributes it as being God's own and he sees himself just as a caretaker. He does not have, I mean, he does not have a sense of ownership. I own it. It is mine. A one who does not lay claim or ownership to divine resources in his or her care. Some lay claim to what God has given to them. In their mind, they have that mentality, this thing is mine. Some feel, in their lifestyles, they may not be saying it, but in their lifestyle, they d- display a sense of ownership, an entitlement mentality towards God's resources in their care. If you're going to be a trust in God's kingdom, you must be one who in thought, in conduct, in deed, in lifestyle, you don't lay claim. You don't have a sense of ownership to the resources of heaven, whether mental resources, financial resources, material resources, land resources. You don't have a sense of ownership like it is yours so that when God makes a demand of it, effortlessly you're able to let go of it like Barnabas, the son of consolation. And that takes me to the third level of explaining who a trust in God's kingdom is. A trust in God's kingdom is one who promptly responds. One who promptly responds to divine calls or divine demands or divine need of the resources in his or her care. I just mentioned the case of Barnabas. Barnabas saw that the church was growing, a new church in Jerusalem was growing. The norm, there were teeming thousands of new converts. There were needs. People needed to be fed. Widows needed to be fed. People needed to be sheltered. Barnabas looked at his estate. He saw that, oh, but I have this land. Oh, I have this property. He didn't have a sense of ownership. He didn't cling on to it that, no, I will not let go of this. He was willing to sell it and bring the proceeds. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 to Acts chapter 5, he, in Acts chapter 4 towards the end, he brought the proceeds to the apostles' feet. Also, for, for Barnabas, it was a case of bringing promptly to meet a need in the house of God, among the people of God, bringing the proceeds of his land that he sold. For Abraham, it was a, it was a case of bringing his son that he waited for decades, decades before the son manifested, Isaac. The moment God made a request of Isaac, Genesis chapter 22, from verse 1, promptly, Abraham went all the way, traveled several days' journey. After three days, he saw the Mount Moriah, where God had made a demand, offer your son, the one that you love there, as a bond offering to me. Abraham did not hold back. Abraham did not cling to that um, child. Abraham was willing to offer promptly a trustee in God's kingdom, is one who is willing to respond promptly to divine demands or divine needs or divine demands in the midst of the people of God or the house of God. For Jesus, the divine demand on his life, I mean, the divine demand on him was his life. God saw humanity. He wanted humanity back to himself. Humanity was disconnected and disjointed, disconnected from their maker, a river that disconnects from source. It's a matter of time we dry up. First Peter chapter 2 makes us to understand that we all like sheep, we've gone astray, everyone his own way. But by the bishop and overseer of our souls, Jesus, who by one sacrifice, he did not sacrifice animals or donkeys, he sacrificed himself to bring humanity and he did it promptly he said sacrifices you do not delight in but a body you are prepared for me he said and lo i come as it is written of me in the volume of the books 
to do your will, O God. Jesus laid down his life. Abraham laid down his son. Barnabas laid down his land. land. But in all these cases, these are people who responded promptly to divine demands. Responded promptly to demands of in, and to needs in the midst of God's people. Hallelujah. I'd like to challenge us as we get on here today, this evening. The, master, the matter of a trustee must be very clear to those God will entrust with riches and wealth in these last days. The matter, the issue, the subject of a trustee, who a trustee is, who can qualify, must be very clear because it's a very important subject for God to be able to bequeath to us the wealth that he's releasing upon the earth and causing us to shift upon the earth today. So the ones whom God will empower in these last days are those who have proved faithful, proved faithful in certain areas concerning handling resources. People have diverse dispositions to wealth and permit me to enumerate some of them. And these are things that can disqualify people from divine empowerment for material wealth. So today, I'm going to take this discourse. This is a long one. So we'll, I will finish a portion of this today, but I will have to continue on this subject, trustees for, of true riches, on Sunday. But here today, I want to take us to the second dimension of our discourse, to things that can disqualify people from becoming trustees. Things and these things apply to irrespective of your financial status, your social standing. God is able to raise the poor from the dunghill and set them among princes. God is able to consolidate the wealth of the wealthy. God is able to raise men from obscurity to prominence. So, what we are sharing, the principles we are sharing here, is not just for the wealthy. If you want to be wealthy by God, if you want to be rich by God, maybe you're already materially wealthy, maybe by hard work, maybe by some other means. But if you want God to give to you sustainable wealth, kingdom treasures, kingdom riches, these are things you need to be aware of so that you don't disqualify yourself from divine trusteeship. So I want to share with us here things we can get involved in, things a Christian can get involved in, things a person who wants God to empower him with true riches, things such a person can get involved in that can disqualify such a person from true wealth and becoming a trustee of true riches. And like us to understand here, these things we're dealing with can be an attitude of the heart which will eventually reflect in the conduct and lifestyle, especially in things that have to do with money, that have to do with people and God. So let me share just about four with us here today. Qualities that can disqualify from divine trusteeship. Qualities that can disqualify anyone who desires to become a trustee of true riches, divine wealth. The number one type of person here is what I call the self-crediting type. The one who always arrogates anything he has achieved, everything he has acquired to himself. And a passage of scripture captures this. Deuteronomy chapter 8 from verse 1 to verse 18. Note it down and study it after now. Some see the riches they get through their skills, their talents, their work experience, their trading, their commerce, their entrepreneurship abilities. Some see the riches they have acquired through such means through their cerebral prowess as products of their ability and hard work. They find it difficult to part with such wealth. They find it difficult to ascribe greatness and glory to God. They become miserly with it, even to the members of their immediate households. People like their spouses, people like their children, people like their parents, people like their siblings. They feel if they want their own wealth, let them go and work for it. If they want to enjoy the largesse of prosperity, let them go and work for it. The self-crediting type. And we have them all across the landscape of society today. Unfortunately, we also have them within the context of our local churches. 
people who take credit, who take personal credit, who take personal glory for the wealth that has come into their hands through their skills, through their hard work, through their abilities, through their cerebral prowess. They take the glory, they take the credit. But let's look into scriptures here. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'd like to read verse 1 and then I'll jump to verse, I'm reading from verse 11 to verse 18. I'd like you to read the whole of Deuteronomy chapter 8 from verse 1 to verse 18, but I need to pick the verses because of time here. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 1 and then verses 11 to 18. God speaking to the nation of Israel. These were like a, an exclusive nation. People who are meant to fear God, who are meant to be children of God. And he spoke to their leader, their pastor Moses. He said to them, every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And we describe that land um, a few days ago on Sunday. But look at verse from verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full on your job, full in your business, prosperous in your entrepreneurship, in your investments, and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them. And when your hands, remember agrarian society, so the measure of their wealth were their hands, their flocks multiply, and their silver and gold multiply, and all that you have is multiplied. He said, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, where you are slaves, where you are uh, 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 um, uh, of low social status and standing. He said, from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness, a place of training for raining. He said, in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land to do you, I mean, where there was no water. Who brought water to you out of the flinty rock? Who fed you in the wilderness with manna? which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you, I mean, and that he might test you to do you good in the end. He said that you say in your heart, you begin to give credit to yourself, you begin to credit yourself as being the source of all these wealth and riches and resources. And you say in your heart, my power <laughs> and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. He said at such times, Quoting here, he said, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which is swore to your fathers as it is this day. So this first category is the category I call the self-crediting type. They take the glory. They, they attribute their wealth to their work, to their in sense of industry, to their entrepreneurship, to their smart investments, to their experience on the job, to their career choice. And they seldom consider God. And many a times it reflects in the way they handle that wealth concerning their spouse. They don't see the wealth as family wealth, as common wealth. They see it as the, as the product of their labor. They don't even share with their children. They don't share with their parents. They don't share with their siblings. These are people who by such thoughts, deed and conduct, disqualify themselves from true riches. They may be wealthy now, but they have disqualified themselves from true enduring riches that will remain spotless, stainless, and not corrupted. The second category I like to describe here is the category, that, um, I use the language of the Bible, the rich fool type rich but a fool in the context of scriptures and i take this from luke chapter 12 you can read the passage from verse 13 to verse 21 in that passage you see how a young man came and started to share with jesus he said tell my brother to share the inheritance with me jesus started in that context to say that who made me a judge or a betrayer, someone who shares estate with you. That's not my call. That's not my assignment. And then he turned to his disciples and started to share some eternal principles with them. You'll see that report. Luke chapter 12 from verse 13. He's, and he told his disciples and said to them, Take heed, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, 
the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully and he thought within himself saying what shall i do since i have no room to store my crops so he said i will do this i will pull down my bands and build greater and there i will have store and there i will store all my crops remember agrarian society and store my crops and my goods and i will say to my soul so you have many goods later for many years take your ease eat drink and be merry but god said to him fool <laughs> god said to him fool this night your soul that is not yours will be required of you then whose will those things be which you have provided or acquired for yourself verse 21 luke chapter 12 so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. If you study this passage after now, when the guy started to talk, the rich guy that God described as a fool, when he started to talk, he was full of I and my and I and my. Actually, when you enumerate the number of times it described, I will do this, I will build that, I will say to my soul, be quiet, be relaxed, you have resources for a generation, you will see 13, I mean, you will see 11, I and my and I and my listed in that passage. Even Satan, who was Lucifer, the self-exalting one, the self-promoting one, even Lucifer, when you read his report in Luke, um, Isaiah chapter 14 from verse 12, the I am I, he said, were five. He did, his thought was, I will do this, I will ascend, I will be like five. But look at this rich fool, five times two plus one. I am I, 11. And you see, there are many people like that in the society, many people like that in, in the church. The moment they say, oh, let's do this for the house of God. Let's do this for the people of God. Let's do this towards the indigent. Let's do this towards the uh, less privileged. They are busy thinking, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I still want to build that my second house. You know, my colleagues, they already have four houses and I have more wealth than them. I must have five houses. I, me, I, my, I, me, I, my. And so you will see here that, I mean, the rich fool, I call this type, the rich fool type, they disqualify themselves from the true riches of the kingdom. They are not rich and generous towards God. They are not rich and generous towards causes that are dear to the heart of God. They are not rich and generous towards causes that will bring God glory. If it will bring them glory, they may consider it. But if it is going to be glory to God, if it will not be something that will be put in their name, they are not generous. They are not lavish towards things that have to do with God. They may be lavish towards themselves. They will not think twice before they buy another car. They will not think twice before they buy a more exotic vehicle. They will not think twice before they budget for an expensive family vacation. But the moment they hear about anything for God, anything for the poor, anything for the less privileged, anything for the orphan, they say, oh, let me go and pray about it. You know, these kind of things, as a Christian, you need to fast. You need to spend time, maybe 21 days of praying and fasting before God will make you consider whether to give 50,000 towards the less privileged when you have a budget of 10 million for your personal vacation and that was not even subjected to a fast. So these people are what I call the rich fool. They may be generous and lavish towards themselves, but they are stingy and very calculating when it comes to the things of God. They will not think twice to give generously to themselves, luxury items, expensive vacation, lavish parties, but they feel they must think, they must pray, they must fast, they must question the rationale behind having to give to the things of God. These are the rich fool type. They disqualify themselves from true riches. A third type here, I call them the showman type. And the Bible captures them, Jesus himself captures this kind of category of people who disqualify themselves from true riches. You find that in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 4. And I'd like to read that. The showman type. And Jesus speaking here, he said, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. Why? So that they can be seen by men. 
They will only give when people will notice it. They will only give when their pastor will notice it. They will only give when people in the press will report it. Jesus said, take it that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by men. Otherwise, you have no reward from your father. <laughs> Positioning for divine trusteeship, you disconnect yourself. They have no reward from your father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet. Trumpet with camera and cameras going around with you. Trumpet with pressmen going around with you. Trumpet with people blowing your siren saying, oh, he's coming. He's coming to do us some good. He said, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. That they may have glory from men. And Jesus says here, assuredly I say to you, they have their reward already. They cannot be trustees of true riches. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed may be in secret between you and your maker, between you and your spouse and your maker. He said, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But you see the showman type, these ones will only give if and when men will notice it. Men will talk about it. Men will uh, applaud it. Men will celebrate it. They, these are people who will like to put up a full-page advert that can cost, in the currency of my nation, over half a million naira. That is uh, about one thousand. I mean, about one thousand two hundred American dollars to put a full-page advert because someone did something of the equivalent of one hundred dollars. <laughs> right. So these are ones who will give only if and when men will notice, acknowledge and celebrate it. They love to give only in public glare, in the fanfare of public camera light. In the film. They even invite press people from news and paper, uh, newspaper stations, from I mean, newspaper houses, from television stations, from radio stations. They invite them to come along because they want to give a gift of $300. They end up spending about $2,000 on publicity. These are the showman type. If the same people are approached for help, where nobody will notice it, nobody will talk about it, where it's just between them and such people, and nobody will report it, they may not be eager to part with anything. Such people, they may be in the church, they may be in the society, they disqualify themselves from true riches. A third, I mean, a fourth one I've shared with us, the um, self-crediting type, I've shared with us the rich fool type. I've shared with us the showman type. Now I'd like to make progress here and show and share with us the what I call the Laban neighbor types. Two personalities in scripture, but they manifested the same qualities. Laban, you find that in Genesis chapter 30, from verse 25 to verse 31. Laban was the elder brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob. And the neighbor was the husband of Abigail who turned out to become the wife of David. So I call these ones the Laban Nabal types. Laban, you find the report in Genesis chapter 30 from verse 25 to chapter 31 verse 16. The report for Nabal, their names sound similar. Laban is L-A-B-A-N. Nabal is N-A-B-A-L. You find Nabal's report in 1 Samuel chapter 25. I describe these ones in this manner. They treat people who work for them either as paid staff or on contract basis with harshness. They are, they, they are harshly, their staff, their employees, their consultants, their con contract staff are harshly treated. They treat such people harshly. They can be inconsiderate and callous. And such people that I call the Laban Nabal types, they don't care. Neither do they have good plans for the future of those who work with them or people who work for them. Whether in a company setting or even in a church office setting, they don't care for the people who are working under them. They don't have any future plans for them. They don't desire the best interests of the people who are working with them or working under them. They only try to secure their own future. The Nabal type, the Laban type, they only try to secure their own future. And many a times, often at the expense of those who build 
who help to build their businesses, build their corporations. Look at Laban, for example. Laban received Jacob into his household and Jacob took interest in Rachel. And Laban, the father of Rachel, told his nephew, who became his staff, Jacob, he said, okay, if you want this lady, no problem, work for seven. Her worth is seven years' wages. And because of the love Jacob had for Rachel, he was willing to work. The Bible says those seven years were like a few days to him. But you know, after seven years of labor, Jacob was given Leah in the name of Rachel. So when he woke up in the morning, he realized that, oh, this is Leah, this is not Rachel. And then the uncle who had now become his father-in-law said, now you have to work another seven years. Our custom is we don't give the younger one before the older one. So you have to work another seven years. So 14 years. But the Bible says because of the love Jacob had for Rachel, those 14 years were like a few days. But then again, after he had worked 14 years, he said he needed to go back to his people. And then he, he told him, his uncle, he said, look, I need to go back. He said, no, I have known by divination that God has prospered me because of you. Tell, name your wages. Jacob asks, give me the spotted, give me the wrinkled, and you'll know later, we'll look into those um, strategies in future. He said, because God had given me a divine encounter, an angelic visitation in a dream. He said, give me the ringed, the spotted, the striped animals. You know what Laban did? He took all those animals out of the flock. He said, oh, you've struck a good bargain. I want that. But he took all the animals that were spotted, striped out of the flock, handed over to his sons. Because all he's thinking about is himself and his family. He doesn't care about stuff. He's callous and wicked towards stuff. He has no regard for them, has no plan for their future. Even though this particular staff is his son-in-law, married to two of his children, had no regard for that. Those are the neighbor and Laban neighbor types. But you know, God shocked this guy. We'll look into that. In further details in the days to come. So that is a wicked person. He thinks only for himself. He only wants to secure himself and his family. He doesn't care about other people. He doesn't care about other members of staff. He doesn't care about the consultants helping him to generate wealth for his organization, for his state as a governor, for the people, I mean, I mean, for the system that is in place. Also look at Nabal. Nabal had a massive, the Bible actually describes Nabal when you study First Samuel chapter 25 as a wealthy man, a very rich man. But you know, he couldn't protect all his staff and all his livestock. David, as a mercenary army, provided service to protect all those animals, protect uh, so that people will not come and attack, animals will not come and attack. So in due course, he sent some of his uh, um, troops to Nabal to ask that, look, give us something. You are a blessed man. God has blessed you in every way. Give us something. And Nabal spoke very despicably to the boys of David and even David himself spoke down them in a very condescending manner. He said, I don't know about any boy who has escaped from his master. That is his business. I don't have any. I you know David wanted to mobilize his troops. He said, let all the men guard their swords. That is also a sign of a man who can be trusted with true riches. With the limited resources, he armed his 600 soldiers with weapons of war. So, with all the resources of Israel, could not arm the soldiers, 3,000 soldiers of Israel, could not arm them for battle. He armed only himself and his son with swords. But look at David, no public resources, no national treasury. He was smart enough with the little resources he was getting from mercenary work, mercenary operations. He armed his 600 men with swords and trained them for battle. Those are signs of people who can be trusted with true riches so you see here the laban and neighbor types let me take it further they only try to secure their own future the future of their immediate family often at the expense of those who help them to build their business empires they may be rich for a season as i close i like to say this put this caveat here such people the laban type the neighbor type whether they're in the society or they're in the church they may be rich for a season but such wealth cannot endure because the principles for enduring wealth, sustainable wealth, is not engaged in their business ethics and practice. And I like to say this here. You notice such people in the society who are wealthy for a while, wealthy for a generation. They say, oh, we used to remember that man. Oh, that man was the richest in that city. Oh, that man was the richest in that nation. They are wealthy for one generation. Then their children struggle to survive. 
their children barely have enough because they have violated some spiritual laws, some spiritual principles that makes God to be hostile and the resources of heaven to be hostile towards them and their children. So their children so, um, struggle to survive. The family wealth is gone because, uh, I mean, the family wealth is gone, excuse me, because it was unrighteously acquired. Study the way God transferred wealth, the wealth of Laban to Jacob. Study the way God transferred the wealth of Nabal to David. And I will close with this. And the scriptures are replete and our society is replete with such examples of people who maltreated people, ill-treated people, treated their staff unfairly, thought only about securing themselves and their immediate families, and many at times at the expense of those who build their wealth for them. You can study Psalm 73 from verse 1 to verse 12. Even the psalmist here was lamenting about the wealth of the wicked, how they call the bluff of God. They do about anything and get away with it. He said, until I went to the sanctuary of the Lord, then I understood their end, that the such wealthy people and their wealth, they stand in slippery places. Study Psalm 73 from verse 1 to verse 12. And Psalm, I mean, the same Psalm 73 from verse 1 to verse 12 and then verse 16 to verse 20. But I would like to close with James chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 6. And then I will pray for people. James chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 6. Please study this passage. Take notes in your notes. Study it in the New Living Translation, the NIV New International Version, the Message Translation, the Amplified Translation, and the New King James Translation. It will show you various shades of the same message God is trying to convey to rich people who use unjust means like Laban, unjust means like Nabal, to acquire wealth at the expense of, mouth, of other people who help them to amass the wealth. But I want to read the Weymouth translation of the New Testament. Weymouth, W-E-Y-M-O-U-T-H, Weymouth. He said, come, you rich men, weep aloud and howl for our most eating. He said, I tell you that the pay of the laborers who have gathered in your gold and your silver and your wealth and the increase of your organization have become covered with rust. And the, and the, and the, and the rust of them, of the laborers who have gathered in, in your crops, pay which you are keeping back is calling out against you. And the outcries of those who have been your reapers have entered into the ears of the Lord of the armies of heaven. King James, New King James calls it the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of war, the, laws of, the Lord of the armies of heaven. He said, here on earth, you have lived self-indulgent and profligate lives, wasteful lives. You have stupefied yourselves with gross feeding, but a day of slaughter has come. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous man, and he offers no resistance. These are the labor neighbor types. And I like to say this here. The wealth of such people are not generational, cannot be sustained. Many a times their children beg for food. They are wealthy for a moment. The moment they die, the wealth goes south because they have engaged on godly principles. They have been callous. They have been wicked. They have taken advantage of other people's brain, other people's skills, other people's talents to build, to amass wealth. And then they push away the ladder and all the people who help them to erect the ladder of rising to the top. Such wealth, I can assure you, is not sustainable and cannot endure. I challenge us, friends, make up your mind to become a trustee of true riches. As I close here this morning and this evening, I like to pray for people. There are people who want to repent, who realize that they've been wrongly guided. They've been kylos, they've been selfish, they've been rich, but they've been fools in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the perception of God, in the explanation of heaven. They've been fools. There are some who feel they will not give unless it is trumpeted. They will not um, attend to the needs of other, other people unless it is publicly um, declared. And I see some people who are willing to repent today because grace is coming even through this broadcast and through the prophetic word we shared earlier, grace is coming to equip people, to raise people, 
to empower people to raise trustees of true riches no matter how your background has been a new dimension is coming upon your life to bring true riches true treasures true wealth into your life i'm going to pray for people here this moment and i'd like you to get ready and amongst other things i'm praying for god to equip you and train us with the right values of his kingdom for wealth let us pray Father, I thank you for such an awesome time in your world today. I thank you for hearts you are melting. I thank you for hearts that are repenting. I thank you for hearts that are embracing the truth of your word. I thank you for those who will hear this broadcast hereafter and align appropriately and repent of their wrong ways that they may position for the true riches you are bringing to them in the days to come. Lord, I pray, let your grace flow even through these broadcast channels. Let your grace flow. Let the grip of wickedness, the grip of worldliness, the system, the bigness ethics of the world that has caged your people and denied them of true riches, let those powers be broken. Let those yokes be destroyed. Let those captivities be turned around in the name of Jesus. And I pray for you, for God to remove from your heart, for God to remove from our hearts and lifestyles the things that can disqualify us from true riches. I pray for the release of the Spirit, for trusteeship, divine trusteeship, divine wealth creation, divine wealth empowerment in the nations, for staff, for contractors, for consultants. I pray that you will treat people fairly, you will engage the right business principles, right business ethics, and God will bless. Men may mock you, but God will lift you in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for supernatural breakthrough, Oh, into ideas from heaven, into divine wisdom, into divine favor, favor with God and favor with men. I pray for supernatural breakthrough by divine strategies for wealth creation and wealth distribution and wealth empowerment. May God raise you. May God find you. May God equip you. May God anoint you. May God bath your feet with, um, with butter like he did for Job. May God enlist you like he enlisted Solomon. May God make a promise to you like he made to Abraham. May God fulfill his word in your life. May God take you from strength to strength may God make you positioned and aligned as the currency of shift of wealth is coming upon the earth may God position you, may God align you, may God release uncommon ideas, uncommon strategies uncommon business ethics from heaven into your life, go and excel, go and do valiantly go and leap over walls put by men and the systems of the earth go and run through troops, barricades put by human policies that oppose the counsels and wisdom of God go and excel it's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day upon the earth. And I trust God that your testimonies will be awesome and you'll be willing to share your testimonies. He said they overcame him, overcame poverty, overcame the demons of Mammon, the princes of darkness. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, covenant, and by the word of their testimony, confession and testimonies to God's goodness. And they loved on their lives, even unto the death. They were willing to stake their integrity for the things of God. Get ready, friends. It's a new day. It's a new climate, a new atmosphere over your life and your business endeavors. As we close today, I'd like us to honor the Lord with our substance. Give your worship and substance. Give your offering. Worship is not complete until we, con I mean, we, we connect it with substance from our hands to worship the Most High. And you'll see the details of how you can give online let us give willingly generously cheerfully and don't be like the mockers who say who are those kind of men of god in these kind of conditions we are going through who are raising offerings we are positioning you for divine wealth we are positioning you to be delivered from the corruption of the system of the world to be connected to the purity and power of the system of god's kingdom and we refuse to be uh, we refuse to be uh, humble, to be subdued by mockers who don't even know the principles of God, who want to take the position of God in the things of God. Give generously, willingly, and cheerfully, and let the Lord be glorified. And then remember, we continue this discourse, especially this teaching, Trust Your True Riches. We we'll continue in our next online service, which will be on Sunday, Nigerian time, from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, or maybe a little after 10 o'clock. It's going to be awesome. And we're not just sharing teachings. You can go to YouTube, get on Facebook, and listen to this um, teaching again and again, internalize the truth content, because it will generate an atmosphere. 
an atmosphere of divine wisdom, an atmosphere of divine inspiration, an atmosphere of heaven's infrastructure that will help you to be able to build your business, build your finances, whether over swampy terrain, over murky waters, over mountainous ranges, you will break through, you will break forth as the Lord lives. Hallelujah. So until another broadcast, remember Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, he is alive. He who he was, I mean, he though he was rich for your sake and my sake, he became poor. That through his poverty we may become rich. The Lord bless you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and grant you peace on every side. Remember, subscribe to this channel, subscribe to our broadcast, get on YouTube, on Facebook. His presence NG. And let's connect together and connect with the great counsels of the Lord. The Lord bless you. Amen.